Uh, thank you so much, Professor Boone, for this really amazing talk. Uh, and thank you all for coming here. Um, and I want to open my, uh, my commentary with maybe a, uh, another metaphor for the thing that your book is doing. I think we all know we have, the reason we have two eyes at the front of our heads is that having a slightly different view of the world from each eye is what allows us three-dimensional uh, vision of this world. And I think maybe what you do is like exactly this. We have what, two different uh, views of the same subject, uh, homoerotic practices, homoerotic desire in the Middle East. And by having these two different views, we can have a more rounded, uh, a more complete uh, picture of this uh, issue. Well, naturally, we can never have, uh, you know, um, a perfect uh, vision of any historical subject. Like much, we can't see what's beyond the wall. But I can, th I think we can agree that you know, three-dimensional is uh, better than two-dimensional. So thank you for that. Um, and reading this book as an historian of uh, Iranian uh, masculinity, uh, that is my, uh, my field of research, um, I was naturally more interested in what you had to say about Middle Eastern sexualities and uh, more than about their representations in European uh, texts and art. I wanted to know uh, what, okay. Uh, what uh, Professor Boone's approach, his method, uh, had to teach me uh, as somebody who comes from outside my discipline. So what can I learn from this new uh, approach? Uh, so in a way, I did remain, oh. Yeah. Since you were the same thing. Yeah. Uh, I did remain with my own uh, 2D vision, uh, but I added more uh, color and more detail to it by reading your book. And my commentary today would be uh, mostly limited to this uh, specific topic of uh, homoerotics uh, in, uh, in the Middle East and in Iran especially. And I think um, a very important claim uh, that, uh, that you've mentioned in your talk, and uh, this is, I think is very, very important, is what you call in, in your second chapter the claim about um, the myth of age-differentiated and gender-defined sodomy as the primary formation of male-male sexuality in Islamic hate culture. The book shows that the definition of who was the boy lover or the beloved could range in age from pre-adolescence to late 20s, and that um, the beloved could very well take, uh, take the role of the active, active partner in uh, sexual relations, for example. And this uh, could go against, uh, some, uh, against the claim that the appearance of full facial hair uh, put a clear end to homoerotic relationships, and that the sexual practices of such relationships uh, were always determined by the status of the partner. Uh, and this is really something that we, we see a lot in, uh, in the study of Middle Eastern sexualities. Um, and in, in some of the sources that the book describes, uh, the differentiation between adult lover and adolescent beloved does not necessarily exist. They are ambiguous or silent uh, about this issue. We have scenes of homoerotic love or of the coffee house that, uh, sh um, that show that young men, and by the way, um, young men unlike boys, and I would love to hear, uh, um, I, it's very interesting for me to hear about the original terms and how you chose what to translate as what. Um, so these young, uh, young men, and not boys, stood at a juncture where they could be either lover or beloved. Uh, and of course, when you think about it, it makes perfect sense uh, because even the, um, the line between adolescence and adulthood is not clear cut. And even the biological markers, yes, the, the facial hair are um, fuzzy, excuse my pun. Uh, so could, this, could these young men uh, be the closest to what we think of today as homosexuals? 
because they could um, they were attracted to men both older and younger. Uh, they could uh, play they could play each role in the sexual dynamic. So this is, I think, maybe the most important thing that I personally took uh, from the book, and I certainly intend to uh, you know pay it forward when I would uh, teach my future students. Um, and it might have taken somebody from outside the discipline to challenge these assumptions and understandings that became kind of common knowledge among historians of sexuality um, in the Middle East. Another important contribution is really the fantastic use of visual sources. And you saw some examples um, of this in, in the book. And what interested, uh, interested me most are works that I don't think many people, many uh, scholars have seen, and I also am very interested in the whole issue of the pornographic materials uh, that, you, that you brought to light. And I want to hear your thought about how do we use pornographic materials as primary sources? Do we use them in another way than other visual materials at all? Uh, if so, how? Um, and how much can they attest to the actual practices and their prevalence and acceptance? Because often in pornography, um, it is the deviant, the taboo, the non-normative that takes a central stage. So um, this is definitely something I would be uh, interested in uh, your thoughts about. And in here, I would like to answer, enter some of my own uh, findings about the history of male homoeroticism in Iran during the late 19th century and the early 20th century. So as, as shown, and as we, where are we at? Okay, it didn't switch, okay. Um, being um, boy loving was fairly accepted and considered uh, normative until this period. Uh, and here we have a portrait photo of a man with his uh, boy lover who is also a dancer, one of the, one of the tropes uh, that Professor Boone talked about. Um, now, this is a portrait photo, and portraits are supposed to present their subject uh, in the best light possible. So we can see here that men had no problem with uh, having their portrait taken with their, uh, with their boy lovers. Um, in, uh, so uh, this was very much um, the whole issue of boy dancers was very much in existence in Iran until even the late 19th century. Um, the photos that I use in my uh, research are, uh, in this presentation mostly, are taken from an amazing uh, photo album by Ali Khan Vali Qajar, uh, a Persian uh, Iranian aristocrat who went with his father uh, to Russia uh, where he learned how to, uh, how to operate a camera and then uh, brought a camera back with him to Iran where he took uh, a lot of photos um, during his lifetime. He was also a governor in several places. So we can see this, um, this really interesting um, album that has like 1,500, uh, 1500 photos and uh, was totally digita uh, digitized and uploaded online for free by Harvard University. And in here, we can see the placement of the, of the photo, another portrait photo of a man with a boy dancer. And you look at the, at the smile of this dancer, look at the proprietary hand gesture. Um, so we can see, you know, um, there is no, pr these pho photographs are not hidden. They are not categorized. They are not segregated as something that is, you know, unique. They're just part of the album. Um, and, okay, so this is one thing. And another thing that um, really made, uh, made me very happy when I read the book um, was, uh, was the analysis in, in Persian miniatures. There's an entire chapter about Persian miniatures and how beautiful boys were depicted in such Persian miniatures really corresponded and supported something that I saw uh, and wrote about in Persian photographs uh, of young Iranians from, from the turn of the 20th century. Now, when my dissertation, 
um, came back from the reviewers, one of the comments that I received was that I've made too much of the crooked positioning of, uh, of young men in, in photos such as this. They have said this. To me. <laughs> <laughs> um, and this is unlike very stable, very upright uh, photographs of older men. So in these photos, we can see the elegance, the affluence, uh, the languid posture, and the averted gaze uh, that, as I learned from the book, were all part of the ideal of the beautiful youth. Another th interesting thing about photographs of, uh, of adolescents in, um, in this period is many of them appear bareheaded. And this is something that is very uncommon and is considered improper, uh, not just among uh, adults, but also among boys. Mostly you see photographs of, of kids and they have their uh, hats on. Um, okay, so uh, this is all, so I, I believe that these things attest to the fact that such youths were still looked at as objects of desire, uh, a look that found expression in the borrowing of miniature painting conventions uh, in the photos. Uh, another thing that I uh, encountered was the whole issue of westernization. And as historian Afsane Najma Badi already showed, um, how she showed how the westernized dandy, the Fokuli or Farangi Moab, was suspected as, uh, as an amrad, meaning um, a beautiful youth, or as an amrad numa, meaning an older man who tries to look like a youth so that he can still be uh, object of desire for other men. And, and this is because of the style um, sorry, because of the style of the, of the dress and of the facial hair, because westernizers often uh, shaved their faces, which was considered, you know, uh, like a taboo in Iranian society, shaving the entire face. And in these two photos, we can see that these are the same people being photographed, uh, but the dancer changed his clothing from traditional dancer clothes to a western suit, including a pocket watch uh, with a chain. Uh, and once again, we have him seated on a bench, which is a, uh, a Western object, but in a posture that is taken from the tradition of miniature painting. <coughs> uh, another beautiful uh, example of a young Westernized dandy uh, positioned in a similar way is, is this photo. It's taken from another source. And we can see really all the angular lines of his body um, to the, you know, the playful tilt of the hat and the asymmetrical lock of hair and the very loose hand over there. Um, so these dandies were really uh, objects of male desire. And we can also see the connection between um, westernization and, uh, and desire in this song. This is like a street song that would be sung about those uh, focolis or dandies. And we can see that actually the markers of, uh, of westernization, the red bow tie, the brimmed hat, the, the tight trousers that expose the wearer's business and package, mm -hmm. or his uh, jacket that reveals his uh, mountains path, they are all the same, meaning the objects of westernizations are the symbols of, um, of desire. Um, and I think if we, can, if we take into consideration the issue of power relations between Iran and the Western powers in the late 19th century, but also between adult uh, lovers and uh, adolescent beloveds, this is something that we can see how they kind of uh, interconnect in, uh, in the sources or in this, um, in this song, um, because we can really see how the desire for the West, it's also a desire to subjugate the West, and they're both apparent uh, in the desire to sexually conquer the westernized dandy. Um, and if, if, if we talk about power relations, and if I have one thing that it's not so much as a criticism, but a suggestion when you will read this book, and, and please do read this book because it's really um, a great book. Um, I, I have a, an issue 
with uh, with power relations as these um, as these um, sexual relations between adult men <coughs> and adolescents are described. Um, and I think one thing that most books on homosexuality in the Middle East usually ignore, um, and most likely it's due to lack of sources, but is the degree to which the erotic relationships between adult men and boys were or weren't consensual. Uh, now, uh, Professor Boone does not ignore this fact, uh, but I think more needs to be said on the issue because it, it is might well be possible that some of the boys were in their mid to late uh, teens or even older, but we must also remember that the growth of facial hair, which was still really the marker uh, of such relationships, could, wo could well be at the age of, age of 13, 14. Um, so the question of age is really far from clear cut. And other than uh, Janet Afari, most writers don't name these older men as pedophiles. Uh, if we do name them as such, then perhaps suddenly those beautiful verses that praise wine and boys, celebrating the boy's drinking that leads him to submit to the poet's desire, will make us uncomfortable again, and I think we should feel uncomfortable. The thing is, we don't have the voices of these boys. We never encounter their description of the relationship which naturally makes it very problematic to know what happened. Um, by the way, it's also very interesting to, uh, to see um, that European, the, the disgust and shock shown by European travelers was, were not so much about the fact that children were being treated as sexual objects, but that these children were male. If we follow, following their texts, these um, Orientalist European texts, there's a danger of reproducing this approach of focusing on gender, not on age. Much like following the Middle Eastern sources uh, runs the risk of accepting a romant romanticized view of such relationships that were not always consensual. Um, and this is, of course, something that should be mentioned along, alongside the fact that sexual norms were different then and there, uh, and the definitions of childhood, what a child is. Uh, similarly changed during the centuries. Uh, so maybe more than the question of age per se, uh, the question of power relations and consent uh, should be addressed. Not necessarily in this book because you know, it does not presume to be a history of Middle Eastern uh, homosexuality. But we, it's something we should keep in mind. Um, and now coming back to Iran of the early 20th century, I believe we can, still, we can still see traces of this type of homoeroticism even later on, uh, during the 1930s. Then a new male body, um, body image was constructed and promoted by the state and by Iranian modernizers. The new young male body had to be muscular, athletic, upright, and ruddy-faced. The creation of this body was facilitated by modern sports, by the Boy Scout movement, and by military service. And when I read the descriptions of sporting events and spectacles, I could not but feel the erotic pleasure of the reporters had when uh, they described to their readers the beautiful and exposed young uh, male bodies. Um, so the context, of course, was totally different, but something of that practice of gazing at beautiful youth remain. So in here, like George Mosse and Afsani Najmabadir herself have shown, we, we could also see the sublimation of homoerotic desire with a desire for the modern nation. But this is another story altogether, and will be told at a different time. So now I will turn to your questions to uh, Professor Boone and to your comments. Thank you very much.